Thank you for having uh, three extra, uh, or maybe I should say 2.5, uh, a little Jerusalem on the back. Uh, but look, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you here this morning, um, and, and I mean that in the sense of to be with people who are persevering in faith. So when I say it's a pleasure, that's what I mean. Uh, for Jesus says to all uh, the churches, if I'm not correct in Revelations 2 to 3, says to the ones who are victorious, and he's not talking about himself, he's talking to the ones who have persevered, and he gives them the title to the ones who are victorious. And as you, uh, how many of you have supported uh, Open Doors and you get to prayer or you're, you're connected to the persecuted church in some way over the years? Thank you for your support. Um, the perseverance um, is not an unfamiliar thing if you've heard uh, the pers- stories of the persecuted church. Uh, definitely today as I think about blessed be the name of the Lord, you give and you take away. The stories that are happening, that have happened in the last year, that are happening even today, uh, for me are some of the most exciting things that, are happen- that God is doing throughout the world. The stories that I come into contact with open doors, Travelled to the Middle East last year. Um, the things that are happening are still just as exciting as when Brother Andrew um, crossed over into Russia um, or the Soviet bloc as it was then in 1955. I can't tell you the stories that I've read in the last couple of months because of the sensitivity around them. But can I uh, encourage you and exhort you that the stories uh, that Brother Andrew, I was watching one of his interviews in uh, one of the American TV shows many years after his, um, his foray into the Soviet bloc. And he was describing to this secular uh, media show of how they were smuggling Bibles. The similar stories are happening um, even this month around the world. And if you've kept up to date with particularly the last 25 years of the uh, World Watch List um, that comes out every year, it's one of the most recognised and authoritative lists of its kind in the world. Uh, Some of our Australian members um, in Sydney, because of how it's recognised, and and what I mean by that is the UN and the European Union, a number of submissions have been made over the years, and and of course different governments around the world, but in Australia we were invited to give a submission on the Religious Freedom Commission that was happening. And I think what strikes me out of last year's research is that one in nine Christians, that's not one in nine Christians in persecuted context of that um, of the stories that you know very well in the extreme persecution that's one in nine Christians globally are persecuted for their faith. 245, that's a conservative figure specifically of those who are in the most extreme context and pressured or either physical violence in some way. Last year, in in quite a difference uh, compared to the last couple of years of the World Watch List, 90% of Christians that were killed for their faith came out of one country, and that was Nigeria. And in terms of when we talk about in our organisation with the research, we're very conservative on figures. So it's not people that were killed for political or secondary reasons. This is for their witness of faith and of Jesus. And when I look at that, and then maybe you know you may feel the same way, you know, you hear those figures, or even when we think about the landscape here in Australia, what will it be like 10 to 15 years time? The story of the persecuted um, believers and their stories that would encourage us is when the human eyes, you look at a statistic like that and think, well, hang on, the question of are we winning, are we losing, become, it looks like a relevant question. To human eyes, maybe you would answer that type of question in a particular way. But the kingdom of heaven is not of this earth. There is a spiritual reality, even in your street, even on my street. And the kingdom is advancing in the most pressured environments around the world. I think my um, uh, trip, I was just talking to um, John and Joan, was it? 
uh, earlier, they were talking about the ministry that they've done many over the years, and I was privileged to, to visit um, that sector that you guys laboured in love for many years in the Middle East, and, and seeing our faith under very extreme circumstances for the believers that I've met. And one, one gentleman who had to pick up in the middle of the night because someone came through um, his city and, um, and on motorbikes and, and verbally were told, if you are a Christian, leave tonight. If you are here in the morning, it is on your head what will happen to you. Around those years, particularly when ISIS was at its height. And he picked up, he was a, a man at three restaurants, picked up with many others in the Christian community, grabbed what they could and fled. And we were standing in one of the restaurants, one of the projects that we partner with in that particular area is for, imagine, 200 families rocking on your doorstep at church and saying, hey, we're of faith, we're your brothers and sisters, can you help us? Being a Christian might mean um, getting jobs are not easy, particularly in an environment where there are refugees. Part of the work in that area is creating sustainable businesses for Christian communities with the accountability of the local church and through the local church, they decide, yep, that person has the skills, let's set up something and then we can have other brothers and sisters working for them and they can survive this environment. And we were, um, we were meeting with this brother in the restaurant that he was managing and uh, someone asked him, um, do you blame God? And it didn't even compute on his face. <laughs> And as it was translated, his face changed into... It, it, wasn't a, it was a confused look, and, and his hands went up like this, and he said, we like God. Why would we blame God? God loves us. God is good. The kingdom of heaven is advancing. In that particular community, um, a bit further out, sorry, in that region... Uh, food was getting to um, some brothers and sisters because of the support of many in Australia um, partnering with the work there. And um, there were Muslim refugees as well living side by side. And the comment um, was made by some of the Muslim refugees to, the, to our Christian brothers and sisters. They said, where are you getting your food? No one's feeding us. And they said, well, our Christian and brothers are feeding us. And they said, well, can we have some? And so the, the Christians in that area um, uh, communicated with the Partner Foundation and, and uh, said, talked about the situation and worked something out. And the Muslims in that area now have a new saying. And the saying is, we have Allah in heaven, but we have the Christians on the earth. You know, can you cook? Is there someone around in your community that you can invite over for a barbecue? Food and the love of God and how it manifests. The kingdom is advancing. Um, and our work is to help people stay in their countries. In a country like uh, the one I went to, where 30% used to be Christian, now it's 0.7%. Our mission is to help them stay and to advance the gospel. When I mentioned Nigeria before, and one of the stories there that stands out because of the faith and the people that we work with in um, in this country. And has anyone, did you hear the story of Leah? Leah in um, Nigeria was taken with a bunch of girls um, by Boko Haram last year, if you're familiar. Yeah, 110 girls. And uh, I was just reading up uh, recently on, on where this story is at. And um, what strikes me is that for those of you who know the story will know that. Um, Part of, uh, well you may not know this aspect, part of our work is advocacy in, with various governments. And the Nigerian president was in a western country and uh, the internal communications was, hey, us along with a few others are going to get to speak into before they have this meeting the next day and, and raise the issue of persecuted Christians. Nigeria, 90% of Christians killed in the reporting year of last year and then seeing the president bring up with the Nigerian president said what are you doing with the Christians on international television um, the, the girls were released and they were notified uh, the government was notified of the country um, the girls would be on a bus 
and they will come there and organise a particular location. So you can imagine if you've ever had a school pickup and all the parents um, are there as the bus was pulling in and the anticipation as this was a very different camp. So you can imagine the motions would be even more heightened of seeing their children and thinking, what did they go through? And Leah's parents were there, excited, nervous. And as these girls were coming off and getting to the last five and going, oh, okay, she must be trying to see through the windows. Third girl, oh, she must be the last two. Last girl comes out thinking, are there any more? That bus looks empty. And finding out that the one girl that wasn't released was Leah because of her faith. And the Boko Haram men said, and we will not let you get on that bus unless you renounce Jesus. So she didn't get on the bus. And there's a few other aspects to that story. But to leave you with the message that she sent through to through some of her friends to her mother. And this is a message I want to make sure I get the wording right. She said, Mother, you should not be disturbed. I know it's not easy this evening, but I want to assure you that I am fine where I am. I am confident that one day I shall see your face again. If not here, then there, at the bosom of our Lord Jesus. Mm. Uh, in February, the update was she still hasn't been released. They've heard um, some comments that she's still alive. Clearly, she hasn't renounced her faith yet. And her father said, We are very sad, but I am so proud that she hasn't rejected Christ. Around many places around the world, um, part of our work is working particularly in women's ministry. Um, Pakistan is a country where we partner, particularly where violence towards women is very focused. And in that region of the, of the world, you can understand trauma care um, and, and counselling um, women who have been brutalised or, or whipped or have been kidnapped and then used up and then released back and the Christian community finds them again. Helping them walk through in faith, where to from here? Things that they can't describe verbally, how do we get them to process it? and then engage back and even be a further witness to loving your enemy. Which, you know the stories where you think, how could you love your enemy? As I said, um, Bible smuggling is still happening in many places around the world. Where in the words of Paul, it is better to obey God rather than men. And uh, uh, the, the work that we specifically do and have did begin with Brother Andrew continues specifically with not just persecuted believers because there's persecution and then there's the underground church which there is persecution on them in certain ways if they become known but it's, it's two distinct um, groups and we work specifically um, with those groups that many people um, can't reach. And Bibles are still getting to those individuals. And uh, let me encourage you of something that I saw the other day, that if you heard it, it would encourage you in the way that um, the Project Pearl in 1989 to China, uh, uh, um, over one million Bibles delivered on one night to the beaches of China, for those of you who remember. Things as audacious as that, miraculous stories are still happening around the earth. Um, if you are... Um, don't support us in terms of a frontline partner. For those of you, if you've got the prayer guides and you get that either with an email or you don't yet and you would like to come and get our free um, uh, emailed updates or um, delivered updates to you um, by monthly in hand mail about what to pray for. For those of you who align with what we do um, and you haven't heard of what does it mean to be a frontline partner, what we talk about is what region of the world does your heart align with? Maybe it's Africa, Middle East, um, Asia. I can't, we can't get more specific than that because of um, reasons that you will be able to appreciate. Or the fourth region that we talk about where most needed when extreme things happen unexpected in the world. 
And we talk about what region do you align with, and then our second question is, what subscription could you match in your life? Um, maybe for uh, yeah, some sort of Netflix subscription. Or maybe it's an unofficial subscription like myself where it's one coffee a week. Ruth and I just go, okay, one coffee a week we'll dedicate for a monthly partner, frontline partner. But our question is, what is the least amount that you could give for the longest time? So if you align with a particular region and, um, and, and you have the capacity to do so, come up and have a chat and uh, talk about what that looks like and what that means. Uh, as well as um, some of the latest newsletters there that have further stories. Even for friends who aren't Christians, the amount of non-Christians that I've been talking about recently, about the stories that have come across, and it blows their minds. If you have a friend um, who, whose field you've been working in for a while, take one of those um, newsletters um, home and give it to them. And go, I heard this this Sunday. You've got to read this. I know your experiences about Christians... But you, man, you've got to read this. Woman, you've got to read this. So be blessed. Uh, looking forward to connecting up the back again. And, and if you, um, your, um, those leaflets that are there, join the front line. Um, have a look. And uh, if that's you, just bring that up the back as well. And, and I can talk about that with you then as well. Thank you. And briefly.